Hi, and welcome to the seventh episode of Touring the Multiverse. This is the first limited series of the It's a Mimic podcast, where I, Dave, lead you... And the wonderful, glorious, amazing Adam. On a tour of one of the published campaign settings for Dungeons & Dragons, 5th edition. Over the course of this series on Eberron, I'll be breaking down history, lore, settings, populaces, adventures, and player options. Will I give some quick insights into the unique monster stats that Wizards of the Coast has provided us? Today, we're covering Dragon Marks. So climb aboard the lightning rail and join me as we look into the steampunky world of high adventure as presented in Eberron, Rising from the Last War. Dave, what's a dragon mark? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Allow me to feed you a topic. Yes. So, dragon marks, they're a symbol that's etched into the skin. Kind of like a really vivid tattoo. These aren't just marks, but they are actually flesh made of magic. Okay. It enhances the user's ability to perform tasks in relation to what kind of mark they have. Now, there's 13 marks, one for each house, plus... That's not a hard line on that one. Like, there is a little more. We'll get into that later. Uh, and But each mark is tied to a specific bloodline within a certain species. Okay. All right. Okay. So, for instance, the mark of healing you're only going to find on halflings. And that's only going to be on a certain bloodline of halflings. But those bloodlines may have branched off from many, many years ago. What will happen is the people that are part of this bloodline will, normally around adolescence, manifest these tattoos. Or not tattoos, but marks. Uh, But again, they don't always follow a particular bloodline, and not all in the bloodline get it. So, for example, people in the Smith household will all have the ability or the potential to manifest this kind of dragon mark, but crazy uncle Jed went off and married this person and down and down in that branch of the family tree, they also potentially get it. And as time goes on, the dragon marks keep getting passed down, but yes, over time, the bloodlines spread out. However, once the mark is established within a bloodline, that bloodline normally joins with the others. And this is what creates one of the dragon marked houses. And again, these all all the individual houses are particular to an individual species, sometimes more than one, but for the for the most part it's one species. Yeah, if this one is for half elves, then it's certainly not for gnomes. Do we know where the dragon marks come from? Does it get into it in the book at all? Like was this a blessing from the progenitor dragons or is this people that are descendant of those that fought in the original war to knock the fiends back or the overlords or whatever? No. It just is. It always has been. Why they are there, that's one of the things for you to decide. As a a DM? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Well, I mean, I haven't come across anything in my extensive research I've been doing for these. So, that's my interpretation of it. Uh, Now, the Dragon Mark houses, they use these gifts to control business and establish monopolies. Say that the house that deals with the Mark of Detection... They might own different detection or detective agencies all throughout Corvair and beyond. Now, the people working in these detective agencies may not be dragon marked, but it belongs to the marked house. So they have, you know, essentially a, a house agents, essentially. Right? Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. This kind of control gives the houses kind of a one of a kind power. It allows them to operate in most nations and, and everywhere else. Galifar, the kingdom, used to keep them in check. However, since the last war, they've pretty much been unregulated. So when we talk about all these nations that have the intrigue and the espionage, there's also like political power moves by houses as well and noble like dragonmark houses. Yeah, some of the some of the houses don't have any drive for nobility and titles and stuff like that. They are genuinely trying to do the right thing. But that's not necessarily the case for all of them. Yeah, okay. So you're going to run into... Like, I guess there are different houses in different different countries or nations, right? So Well, they all have a presence in most of the nations as there's profit to be had sure. in their particular talents. Okay. Right? But- uh, and, and they operate independently of the nations. However... 
They are tied together. They have power in there. Yeah, and people that work for these houses, they're not just tied to the house. They're tied to their nation as well. So they may leave the house to go and work for the nation or vice versa. Or like there's there's a balance there. It's, it's not black and white. Uh, okay, for example, I know um, from talking to Jed a handful of episodes ago that there's House Civis, which has a bunch of gnomes and they do all the communications, all the speaking stones back and forth. Yes. If they really wanted to, they could shut down long distance communications between the nations. Like, so they've got to have if, some sort of like strong arm ability. If the gnomes of Zilargo wanted to cut off the dwarves of the Morholtz, they could just recall their gnomes that have these dragon marks in order to cut them off. So all they have to do is nothing. And it's not like the dwarves can then come in and use the, the speaking stones. It is. An ability that you gain from being part of the house. From, so start up, not from being part of the house, but being dragon marked with that mark. Right, okay. But my point is that you have some political sway just by being a member of these houses, but also by by having a dragon mark. Yes, there is another group that keeps them in check, but we'll get into that, okay? okay. First, I kind of want to just get into what they actually look like. They look like this? Like, like this? You need to see a doctor. Has that gotten any bigger? Uh, no, it's always been this big. Does it get smaller in the cold? A little bit. Okay, all right. You should get Dan to look at it. Seems up his alley. He just wants us to touch it. Pretty sure it's been up his alley. (laughs) Anyways, anyways, anyways. So, dragon marks can appear anywhere on the body. (laughs) Uh, Now, there are, like I said, 12 known ones, but there is also another kind called the aberrant dragon mark. All right, we'll get into that later. Each one has a unique design and a different power. They come in different shades of blue and purple. They shimmer slightly in the light, even especially when they're used. And they sometimes become warm to the touch and glow when you use them. Cool. Now, the other cool thing I liked about Dragon Marks is they cannot be removed. So even if you cut the skin away, it's going to come right back? If you have the Dragon Mark on the palm of your hand and your arm gets cut off, it will manifest itself on a different part of your body. Cool. Cool. So once you have it, it's there forever. It's magically bound to you, the individual, then. Yeah. So now all these dragon marks look similar to start with, but then they kind of grow in size and complexity and and change and so on. So like I said, the different marks for the 12 different houses, if you're part of that one house, your mark is going to look similar to everyone else. However, they do give you a table for some of the minor differences that they can have. For instance, your dragon mark is exceptionally large, small, or faint, It appears somewhere else every time you finish a long rest. It emits dim light in a five-foot radius for ten minutes whenever you use it. And there's others. So so it's you can have fun with it as well. You don't have to stick to the table. But there are other abilities or side effects, I guess, that dragon marks can have. So you as a player, if you wanted to have a dragon mark as part of your, your player character, you could have it, you could choose to have it be like a giant thing that's on the side of your face that everyone can always see. Or you could hide it, or it could move, or Yeah, whatever. to begin with, and then you go for a long rest, and it disappears, and they're all like, OMG, WTF, BBQ. And you're all like, hey, it's over here, and lift up your shirt a little bit, and show them some skin. And they'll be like... Okay, we play very different campaigns. Yeah, my characters don't pull up their shirt and show skin. My character's just naked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so as you can imagine, because of these houses that have been around for a long, 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 long time... A long time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they've got a lot of traditions and secrets that they keep to themselves sure. and so on and so forth. Now, most of these houses are going to maintain an enclave in most of the major cities. Uh, these serve as strongholds and hubs for house business. So if you have one of the higher-ups in the house traveling between different cities, he's probably going to stay at the... It's like a guild house or a chapter house or whatnot, but it's for the, for the house house. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Now, the cities, again, are going to have other shops and businesses tied to the house that just provide simple services to everyday people. And they're not always connected to the house leaders. So, like I had already said, they conduct daily business that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with dragon marks, but are still tied to the dragon mark house. I feel like like these Dragonmark houses might even be unionized or run like a union would. Like, you have your business and it's house business, but you kick back and you've got a representative and you can go to different areas and there are rules that you follow and so on and so forth. I mean, it could be. I mean, You could play it that way is my point. And every house is different. Now, the heir to a house who manifests a Dragonmark is allowed to add a prefix to his house name. So, for instance... 
Kenneth is one of the houses. Mm-hmm. The the heir to the house, the leader of the house, he would go by De Kenneth. It would be D apostrophe and then the, the house name. For a better example, uh, the house that deals with the mark of detection is House Madani. Their leader is Trelib de Madani. Sure, okay. All right, everyone else in the house would just be Madani. There's no D apostrophe. Okay, well, uh, sure. So there's an easy way to be able to, to tell who the leaders are. And who has dragon marks? No, it's not everybody who's a dragon mark. It's just the leaders. It's just the heirs to the house that manifest a dragon mark. Okay, all right. So it's the the royal bloodline of each house. But this this can be confusing and complicated. Yes, it can. Like everything Eberron, there is a lot to it, and it is not very simple. But that's why I love it. So the house leaders have the prefix. However, there are also regional leaders of the house. So the house will have maybe the the leader in Eondare and their leader in the Lazar Principalities and their leader in Kebara. These regional leaders are known as barons. And, I mean, they directly report to the to the head of the house. You, you, okay, you know, like, detective movies or, like, organized crime movies where they sit there with a the big whiteboard and they say, this guy's the leader, and then they have little branches down and say, these are his captains and these are lieutenants all the way down. I feel like you need to have one of these for each one of the, the houses. If you were really to map it out, that's how it would be. Yes. Okay. And they are huge. Uh, right. Now, I'm not suggesting people at home do that because no. that's a... Just ass ton of work, but you should have some idea of what the basic infrastructure looks like. Yeah, and I mean, in in my experience, they've only really hashed out the leaders and some of the house names. The rest of it's open for you to interpret. For the, for the most yeah, part. Okay. I'm sure there is some history oh, I'm there, sure 3.5 has dozens and dozens and dozens. Well, that's of, not what we're here for. Right. Um, so again, some houses are led by... You know, the matriarch-patriarch kind of system. But others are also led by a council. So there's, you know, a lot of people that collaborate in order to run house business. Each house has an emblem. They're very different from each other. And they're just featured on their heraldry, uh, official seals, their crafted goods. And it's almost like a mark of authenticity. Sure. Okay. Okay. If you buy something from the House of Making, House Kenneth... It might have the Kenneth symbol on it, just to yeah. You, you you flip over the old piece of china, you see what the what the manufacturer stamp or or the ink is in there, right? So that makes sense. Are these like coat of arms, or are they like the? If there's an eagle, it means this, or like what are we talking about as far as symbol goes? Uh, and one of them is a hippogriff. Um, another one is the eye of a basilisk. Okay, okay, so these are more like the Game of Thrones banners than than anything else. Yeah, like that level of detail and yes sure. okay now to be very clear these are not what the dragon marks manifest as no these these are house house things not dragon mark things correct these are house symbols not the not the actual mark itself now i said that there was another ruling body that kind of overlooks all of the my, my body rules yeah uh, they are called the 12 okay Ooh. now this is a council their headquarters is in korth which if you remember is the capital of Karnath. Uh, and it's, this, it's weird. It's this giant floating tower. It's not actually connected to the ground. And this is a council where all of the houses meet to discuss house business. And I mean, a lot of things require collaboration. Like you're not going to necessarily, like for airships in particular, House Lurander is not going to be able to make an airship on its own. So they need to collaborate with the other houses in order to... So you would need like the house of making to be able to build some things for you. Exactly. You might want a speaking stone in it, so you need the house civis and so on and so forth. Yeah, so yeah. There, okay. there are things that require collaboration. This all comes through the 12. If a house gets out of line, the 12 reels them in. However, there, there is, of course, power struggles going on. Of course, yeah. Uh, and so on. Now, I said before that these marks manifest in adolescence. Mm-hmm. So what a lot of the houses will do are called the Test of Sybaris. All right? It's a set of trials that's meant to force the manifestation of a dragon mark. Uh, they're different for every house, and it works about half the time. All right, It's just like, a, you know how in the X-Men, a lot of the mutants will manifest their powers through a traumatic experience. It's similar to that. It might not necessarily be a traumatic experience that does it, but... There is a trial that they must go through. It's like a rite of passage, and then one way or the other, they'll know if you have a dragon mark. Exactly. Okay. And like most of the people from the house do this, they go through it. And again, it's successful the half the time. The trial of Sybaris? Test of Sybaris. T- test of Sybaris. Yeah. Now, way back before the last war, 
there was another war called the War of the Mark. And this was when the dragon marked houses kind of got out of hand. Out of that, they have uh, produced what's called the Korth Edicts. Okay, again, Korth is the capital of Karnath. Yeah. That's where the Twelve reside. This prevents houses from owning land, owning titles of nobility, and keeping armed forces, with the exception of House Deneath, because they're the mercenary house. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and they were, they were established back when Galifar was formed. So they're as old as Galifar. They're only a thousand years old. Sure. Give or take. Uh, now, most of the houses presently feel that the edicts are obsolete and should be a thing of the past, but... I mean, I feel like it's not written. However, it's heavily implied that this is just what they're doing to try to grab power now that Galifar has fallen and Corvair has split up. So if you decide to use a dragon mark for the character you're creating, you have to understand that you are going to be bound to a certain bloodline. All right. If you want the mark of making, you're probably not going to be an orc character. You're probably not going to be a dragonborn. Okay. As I understand it, if you decide to have a dragon mark, it essentially replaces your sub race or your your racial trait. You're still going to be a half elf, but you get special rules and yeah. Instead of like say you're a mark with a human, instead of getting plus one to every one of your stats, you would get maybe plus one to constitution and two to charisma. Yeah, as a, a pulling a rabbit out of a hat on that one. That's not an actual. That's just a yeah. So just. Just, that's an example. But you also get spells and you get special abilities and shit from a mark as well, right? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, now, for instance, if if you were a human that got the mark of finding, maybe that gives you dark vision as well. So it's not just your base stats. It gives you additional abilities. Uh, and racial features. Then. Okay, yeah. cool. No, I really like that. So once you choose your dragon mark and tie yourself to that bloodline, you're really then left with the decision to make on what your relationship is going to be to that particular house. Uh, and there's a few different ones. The first one is foundling. Foundlings, they their ancestors left the house ages ago, uh, and they no longer have any ties to the house. You may not have known that you had ties to the house. It may have just manifested itself when you were, you know, out farming in the field at the ripe old age of 15 or whatever. But at the same time, it could all you could also very much know that you had left the house and, and your bloodline hails back to, to the big Dragon Mark house. You just don't want anything to do with it. For example, like you're all entertainers, but you used to be in Kenneth, which is the house of making. You're not interested in forging or crafting, so... You went off to do something else. Correct. Now, if you're going to use this one, there are so many options and directions that you can go with it. Talk to your DM, or if you're the DM and you want someone to talk to your player, uh, because this is going to really railroad your direction, but it's going to give you a wide variety. Most of the backgrounds that you're going to use for this kind of character are going to be like Outlander, Urchin, Acolyte, Hermit. Stuff like that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. that makes a lot of sense. You could also... I mean, you can find a way to make it whatever you want. Of right? course you can. These but are, it just it just naturally lines up to head in this direction. We're leaning in one. Yeah. When, when you pick a dragon mark, it really does a lot of the work for you. It eliminates a lot of the potential other choices you make. Okay? I've Not to say it has to, but... But it, it, it's built kind of to do that. But it also comes with built-in plot hooks too, right? Like, oh, undoubtedly. Yeah. So it's not. It's just a flavor of D&D that you're going to pick when you when you choose a dragon mark. Uh, the next one after Foundling is an independent scion. These are people that were raised and trained by the house, but stayed independent. They don't have special privileges, and they don't have responsibilities to the house. Okay? So these would be good for like guild artisans, entertainers, sailors, soldiers, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's kind of what I was talking about before, where, like, they didn't they didn't give a big middle finger to the house. They're still kind of associated, but they're not getting... Say you got the mark of making, and you didn't have strong ties to House Kenneth. They trained you, they showed you what to do, but then you went off and you became uh, an independent uh, seller of jewelry. Uh, you learned your craft from House Kenneth, but, I mean, you're not giving them part of what you, you earned. Uh, maybe it was House uh, Denise where you learned how to become a soldier and fight, but now you've left and decided to do something else. You do jousting for a living, so it doesn't really count. But Yeah, yeah. You're, you're friendly to the house. Like, you're not an enemy of the house, but yeah. you're, just, you're not there anymore, right? These are the people that don't that don't bother to donate to the university anymore. Pretty much. Yeah. I'm not going to the, uh, to the reunion because, you know, 
Fuck those guys. I had a good time at the school, but I'm not. I'm never going back. Sure. After the Independence Ion, there's the Exorciate. Exorciate. Uh, this is when a dragon-marked heir defies their house and are cut off from the family. In the past, the the mark would be removed uh, and like flayed from the person, but this is no longer practiced. Now, it doesn't say this specifically, but I assume that's just because it pops up somewhere else. Yeah, I guess your punishment, instead of getting 40 lashes, you just get mildly flayed. I mean, that's dark, but I'm assuming that's what it means. Uh, yeah, essentially. The backgrounds for something like this, the Exorciate, uh, would be criminal, charlatan, sage, that's maybe working on a forbidden subject, stuff like that. Okay? Okay. Uh, and the last one would be an agent. The house agent is someone that has good current relationships with the house. And they actually give you a new background in Eberron. It's the only one they do. And it's called the house agent. It makes perfect sense. And I just kind of want to give you a quick little background on what this one in particular does. Is the house agent someone who is very friendly with the house, or is it someone who is an, an employee of the house? As a house agent, you have sworn fealty to the dragon-marked house. If you have a dragon mark, you are likely a member of one of the house's influential families. Otherwise, you're an outsider who hopes to make your fortune through the house. Your main task is to serve as the eyes of your house, but you could be called upon at any time to act as its hand. Such missions can be perilous but lucrative. Straight out of the book. Sure. Okay, yeah. So this... This is not just a relationship with the house. You are the house. Yeah, you work for the house. Yeah. Just to kind of keep going through this real quick here. I'm sure you guys have covered this in a different episode or or will. We will, yeah. We're going to do a deep dive on backgrounds. But uh, just to get into it real quick here. The skill proficiencies you get are investigation and persuasion. Tool proficiency is two proficiencies from the house tool proficiencies table. Which I'll get to in a second. Uh, And the equipment you get is a set of fine clothes, a house signet ring, identification papers, and 20 gold. So a couple of the different house tool proficiencies. So for instance, if you were House Kenneth, you would be proficient with alchemist's supplies and tinkerer's tools. Okay. All right. And it's different for each house. I'm not going to break them all down right now. Yeah. No, there are a ton of them. So. Okay. Also, as a house agent, you always have the ability to go to your house enclave in whatever city you're in and get housing and lodging and food and whatever you need from them. That's why you get identification papers. It identifies you as part of the house. Your dragon mark alone will do that, but maybe you're going to be a house agent without being a dragon marked. Yeah, or maybe you have, a, I mean, maybe not. Maybe you do need those papers because there are people like, what, what were they, the Scion or the Exorciate that are not part of the house, but might have the dragon mark. Yeah, that's true. That's right. a good point. Uh, but there's also a different kind of dragon mark. Okay, it's called the Aberrant Dragon Mark. Uh, now, this one is in, in addition to the 12 dragon marks that already exist. Uh, they are normally considered to be dangerous to the bearer and those around them. They often appear when different dragon marked people have children. So, like, if you've got one person with the mark of healing and one person with the mark of making and they get busy and have a kid, this is where you're going to find an aberrant dragon mark. This is forbidden by the 12, the council that oversees it, everything. Ooh, so Romeo and Juliet level shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is, you don't. This is not public knowledge if you have an aberrant dragon mark. They can appear on any race, at any time, at any age. Interesting. Okay, so if you really want to mess with your players, one of them's getting real cocky, give them a dragon mark. Make it explode. Well, It'd be cool. There are going to be some races. I'm thinking specifically the Volos races, like li- lizard folk, for example. There are no lizard folk dragon mark houses. So would they be able to actually manifest an aberrant dragon mark? Because it's when two houses mingle, right? It's when, no, in two houses, when people... Well, when two different marks mingle. But I mean, I guess, if yeah, these I ones are gnomes and these ones are humans, you got to be a human or a gnome in order to get that kind of aberrant dragon mark. But if like if we know that we have got elves and, and so on and so forth, no Warforged has a dragon mark and cannot get an... an Not yet. Aber, an aberrant one. Maybe they could. They can... Have- Appear on any breathe? race, any time, at any age. Hmm. I've... Because the Warforged are a young race, maybe it's very uncommon. Maybe there's your plot hook right there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to two houses, bump and uglies? No. Okay. No, no, no. And it, that's just a common way to... Yeah, it's it's more common than not. Sure. That's, that, like, that's how you would traditionally get it but it's not the only way uh, also no two dragon marks are alike so if you've got uh house civis 
and host Denise, they get together and make a baby, and then two other people get together and make a baby from the houses, and they both have aberrant dragon marks, they are not going to be the same. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay. And they might not necessarily have an ability tied to either of the houses. Sure. Yeah. Okay. What kind of abilities can you expect with an aberrant? DM's discretion. So there, there, there is a little bit of information on what you can get, but I would imagine that you could do other things as well. So let me get into it. Your constitution score increases by one. Sure. With an aberrant dragon mark, you get one. Uh, maximum of 20, of course. Yeah. You learn a cantrip of your choice from the sorcerer spell list. Makes sense. I like that sorcerers as well. Yeah. Uh, and you also get to choose a first level spell from the sorcerer spell list. You learn it and you can cast it through your mark. Cool. Cool, right, cool, it's cool. like your spell focus kind of thing, right? Yeah. When you cast the first level spell through your mark, you can expend one of your hit dice and roll it. If you roll an even number, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to the number rolled. If you roll an odd number, one random creature within 30 feet of you, not including you, takes force damage equal to the number rolled. If no other creatures are in range, you take the damage. This is crazy wild magic. If you were, if you were going to be a wild magic, if you were a tiefling who was also a wild magic sorcerer and you did this, that would you're you're just a force of chaos. Oh, it's madness. Yeah. Right? Now, aberrant dragon marks also have flaws. You don't necessarily have to have one, but they give you a table of flaws that you can have for your character. A couple of examples: um, your mark is a source of constant physical pain. Your mark whispers to you. Its meaning can be unclear. When <laughs> My name is Steve. I, I like this one, the, the, this next one. When you're stressed, the mark hisses audibly. <laughs> All right. The skin around your mark is burned, scaly, or withered. Uh, animals are uneasy around you. You have a mood swing anytime you use your mark. Your looks change slightly whenever you use the mark. You have horrific nightmares after you use your mark. Okay? I like it, So yeah. it's not all cha-chas and ice cream. But it should be. That would be nice, right? Instead, it's flaw flaws and ice cream. Yes. <laughs> now, there is an option... Stop agreeing with me and acknowledge my terrible jokes. No. Yes. Wait. <laughs> hmm. I, I win. Hmm. I've trapped you. There's also what are called greater aberrant powers. So, it, you don't have to do this. This is more of a DM option. At 10th level, a character has a 10% chance of gaining an epic boon. All right? Which is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm -hmm. If you roll and you don't get it, at the next level, level 11, you get to roll it again and a 10% chance to get the epic boon. And you, if you don't get it, you continue rolling every time you level up. Does this 10% chance add? Like, is it, is it cumulative or is it always a 10% chance? Always a 10% chance. Okay. I like it. Okay. And there there is only one. You don't get to... And this is only for the aberrant dragon mark or just on all dragon marks? Correct. No, I, I asked. I gave you two options. So It is only for the aberrant okay. dragon mark. Uh, okay. Okay. All yes. right. If you are lucky enough to get one of these greater aberrant powers, you have to roll a hit die, okay? Now, you permanently lose this hit die, and when you roll it, you lose that many off the maximum... Yeah, your max HP points. drops by whatever you rolled. Plus your con. Plus your con. Yeah, yeah, okay, so it's like you lose a level worth of health. Exactly. Sure. And that's... Really but, 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 what do you, but what do you get from this epic boon? One of the epic boons that are in the DMG. Oh, okay. All right. So it's not like actually laid out in the Eberron manual. It's, no, this you is, get a legit epic boon from... from, from for, through the DMG. Yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever cool. it is in there. Uh, now, this is something that you are going to talk to your DM about. Maybe he's going to roll it randomly. Maybe you've predetermined what it's going to be. Uh, you kind of get to make up your mind on it, though. Uh, the other thing is that when you lose these hit dice, when you gain the epic boon, you, you this reduction can't be reversed by any means. You do not get these hit points back. So for those of you that have never heard the phrase epic boon before, this is a permanent uh, thing that you get. Your dungeon master awards you to actually get this crazy new magical power. It's usually a magical power. For example, the epic boon of high magic is an extra ninth level spell per day um, that you can cast if you're a caster, right? Is it a specific spell or just another spell slot? Uh, I believe that they hand it out to you as you can cast this spell. Okay. So, um, it, but it's really, 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 it's an optional, it's a variant rule, and it's really customizable for the DM, for the scenario, so. But, I mean, that's the whole point of these dragon marks, is they are customizable. Yes, and so, what, especially to with a, the... To a degree. Well, especially with the aberrant dragon mark as well, that makes a lot of sense. You might get one of these epic boons, and it's cool that they actually worked one of these variants in the DMG 
hard baked into um, into what this this crazy aspect of Eberron is like. So yeah. Now the other thing that I probably should have mentioned before about the aberrant dragon mark is in order to get it, it is a feat. Okay. That might change things. Like a regular dragon mark isn't. No, that that it's a sub race almost. Yeah, but this one is like it's it's just kind of a strange. So if you difference. want if you want to have all of the regular mechanical aspects of let's say a half elf um, from the player's handbook, but you also want a dragon mark that can do a bunch of shit, you can at level eight say, "Hey, I would like an aberrant dragon mark to pop up here." Instead of my ability score improvement. Whereas you cannot do that if you already decided to be a half elf with the dragon mark. You can only get one kind of dragon mark too, right? Yes. Okay. Now, as a DM, I might play with that a little bit and I might work the regular dragon mark rules, not rules, but aspects, aspects features. into the aberrant. So if you want to manifest one instead of gaining an ability score, maybe you have to go through a test of Sybaris. Sure, but I mean, that's up to the DM to yes, work that into Yes, that's all DM this. discretion, yeah. right? Like, work it in. If you just want to give your guy and he, he brings it up overnight, great. Nothing wrong with that either. It's like taking, an, uh, taking a multi-class level in Sorcerer. Sure, you're just sitting on the on the privy one day. Now you have magic. Yes. Uh, now, Aberrant Dragon Marks used to be a lot more common, but the 12 houses united together and... Started a bit of an inquisition. <laughs> All right. That never works out in, as you hope it would. This was the War of the Mark. Ah, uh, because nobody expected the inquisition. Now, since the War of the Mark, uh, these aberrant dragon marks have become quite rare. However, they have had a resurgence since the morning. Oh, because everybody freaked out. End of the world. There's this giant poison cloud. Let's bang. Uh, yeah, sure. Probably. Could be. Maybe. How long ago did the morning happen? Like four, four years four ago? Four years ago, yeah. So you're probably not having adventures with Aberrant Dragon Marks. This is probably some sort of inherent magical thing in Eberron. There's not just a whole bunch of bang babies popping up. Well, again, they can happen at any time, to any race, at any age. They could come out with an Aberrant Dragon Mark. Hmm. Right? These are not manifested in adolescence. They could be, but they're not necessarily. Oh, you get an Aberrant Dragon Mark in the womb, and all of a sudden the like mother, who is not glowing even, yeah, 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 who's not even like... Yeah. It, Involved in the Dragon Mark houses, just like what the shit, honey? There's a weird light coming from your hoo ha. <laughs> Does this look funny to you? <laughs> wah 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 wah. Whom 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 whom. All right, so there's lots of womb for interpretation on this one. Jesus, what is this podcast? All right, continue. <laughs> That's really the basics that you need to know about Dragon Marks. Next week, I'm going to break down a little bit more of the houses. Sure, and then at the end of this series, we're going to get into. The specific dragon marks themselves. Yeah, yeah. The next one, I'm going to... There's 12 of them. There's 12 houses, I'm just right? going to... so many. Yeah, it's going to be real quick and... Yeah, we'll, we'll rapid fire through them. Um, let's grab our dice then and let's talk about what about dragon marks really attracts you to this idea in the first place. And do you like this? Is this something that you would drop into a homebrew campaign if you could? Sure. Let's, let's, let's roll. roll. I got a five. 17. As a player, this is really cool. It gives you more. As a DM, no, get it away. I don't want to keep track of this. <laughs> Why? I'm a lazy DM. Oh, you and okay. Dan are the same no, then. I prep. Okay. Okay. However, I don't want to prep the inter-house relationships and problems that you might come across having a dragon mark, all right? Because this is not something that you can necessarily hide. If you have a big glowing tattoo in the middle of your forehead, I don't want, like, that. that's always going to be something that I have to keep in mind when you're going to a shop in Zalargo. Then you travel to Stormreach on Zendrick, and I got to deal with it there. Then somehow you end up in the Roarholds and the Lazar Principalities, and Everybody is going to recognize this mark, unless it's aberrant, and that might not always be a good thing, which could work out to the DM's benefit, but it also could not. It does add a level of complication, especially when you've got three or four of these marks in a party. So, yes, you're right, but that's where the 12 come in, because when the 12 work together, that's where you can actually bind in the different houses working together. You can have one player with the house of mark, or the, the dragon mark of making well, that was real hard to say you could also have one with the dragon mark of healing uh, and then of course they're all working together and doing their own thing and you know maybe they're sure. 
going but, over but, to a different continent and they're an envoy to Sarlona to try to talk to Redra. Like there's Yeah, I guess like if there's gonna be if I'm gonna have four or five players with different dragon marks, then I feel like I've gotta tell a dragon marked house subplot. In, yes. Right. And it's just it's it's either gonna weigh you down or that's gonna excite you as a DM. Right. So me personally as a DM, I don't really want to get into that. If I was to be a player though if I can have an expanded spell list, I will eat that up all day. Okay. All right. Look, I, I get you. I just, I, I'm all about the intrigue and the, the political leanings of stuff in my own campaigns. And I really push my players to dig into the different factions and organizations and guilds and stuff that make the world tick. If I'm going to go into Eberron with a million different nations, 10,000 distant lands, uh, a whole brand new aspect of the planes with an infinite number of demi planes and all of these houses with all of these different marks with and and there are like there's just so much going on here that if I'm going to choose a setting I'm going to lean into it. Otherwise, what I would do is I would have this say, hey, you know what? You want it to be a um, sorcerer or a spellcast? Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be a sorcerer. You want to be a spellcaster, and you want it to be a half elf. Have you looked at this? Eberron difference, right? Here you go with a different sub race, and it may work out. I would steal all of the breakdown, maybe give you a couple of contacts or not, and just have you be a special kind of of sorcerer that can do this. We talk in a in a, one of our sorcerer episodes about one of the options uh, in Xanathar's, which is about the your spellcasting uh, mark, the sign of the fact that you are a sorcerer. Your sorcerers, what do they call it? Sign of sorcery, I think. Right. And it is a birthmark or something that happens. Your eyes glow when you cast spells, whatever. Why not have it be a dragon mark? Yeah, you could. Right. And you very likely could. And I really like that. You're right. From a player's perspective, that's really attractive. But as the DM's perspective, like it's, I want my players to be able to interact with every house and be able to go on missions that might not, might not necessarily be in line with the house. Right. Like I've got to, I've got to really work my story around. To fit all of these different aspects that I never would have thought of before. Right, but when... It, it adds an extra step. Which, again, I'm a lazy DM. I don't mind prepping. Dan. But I got my limits. But if you were doing a homebrew campaign that's not on Eberron... Yeah, I'd let them do it. Yeah, you absolutely would. Sure. Do you worry that this stuff is going to promote power creep? When you stack this up against a draconic bloodline or a wild magic sorcerer, this... Just the dragon mark race... You put it up against what a human or a halfling can do. Like, this this feels more powerful, right? And I know that Eberron is high adventure, high fantasy, high magic, high power. D- does it feel imbalanced? I would not use the word imbalanced. More powerful, probably. All you're getting is a different stat block, a couple of different abilities, uh, and an expanded spell the list. list yeah. Right? So, like, is it is it that much more well when you stack it up against something like dragonborn it really is because the dragonborn stat block sucks no i get that but that's that's another reason why as a dm you got to really be on the ball with this because now this it just gives you more you had an episode about attacking the character sheet yeah this gives you more to attack it does right and right so as a, a a dm can use this to his advantage but might not necessarily like let me tell you again as you all know 3.5 dave here right uh, power creep was prevalent in 3.5. Like that's what every it was. new book was, was outdoing the other because everything stacked on this. Yeah. Like not everything, but like it just it a lot of became it, yeah. so much. And that's one of the reasons why I love fifth edition is because it really makes it a little more simplistic. You're not doing as much math. You're not. It flattens the math. We are seeing power creep come in now. Sure, it is, and this probably counts as power creep. But it it's far more subtle than in some of the other editions. It's far more controllable. You're yeah. not fundamentally changing the class like a prestige class would. What it is, is just giving you a little bit extra. And in some cases, it's taking things away in order to give you these new things. So although you are getting extra, at the end of the day, you're coming out ahead. It's not that far ahead. Sure. Okay. Again, you're right. It does stack with other things. You can still min-max with it, but it, this is also really going to balance things out too. For example, if you've got something like a life cleric, which is just the best at what it does, and a conjuration wizard, and uh, the bear totem barbarian, these guys are really like exemplary e- examples of what they can do. And then you've got over in the corner a uh, rogue scout. Right. Give him a dragon mark. Give him a dragon mark. Bang. He's going to... 
yeah. get get a little bit more. It, it, this could rebalance a party if you're. It if, could be a tool, not a burden. Yeah, if you've got a um, if you've got a combat heavy campaign and you've got a mastermind in it, right? The mastermind is all about social and and role playing aspects and and mechanics. But you guys are just in dungeons all of the time, and Aber and Dragonmark could be a good way to just give them some sort of crazy magical bullshit, whatever it is. You don't even have to call it a Dragon Mark. You just give them a sign of whatever and steal it out of the Eberron book. Yep. I really like these. Like that's the thing that I would grab more than anything else is the aberrant Dragon Mark, because it feels like I could drop that into anything. I could hand that out as rewards. For, hey, we, we go off, we have to talk to the priests at this temple or whatever in the homebrew campaign. The gods come down and bless us and give us special insignias upon us. And I can change what it looks like. Yours is the eagle and you get great eyesight and also, bam. And I just take everything out of the aberrant dragon mark, right? Like Yeah, you could even make these like, say you're just for picking a, an organization, the King's Guard. And when you get uh, indoctrined into it. They give you a tattoo and imbue it with magical powers. Bam. It's not called a dragon mark, but you can still get these powers. Yeah. And so, right. yeah, we're, we're going to reskin and reflavor all of this stuff. But yeah, you can have some sort of magical brand or I like this better than the magical tattoos that they just talked about in the Unearthed Arcana um, release. But they had a bunch of new conjuration spells and whatnot. And like a lot of it left me really flat. This feels more fun and more interesting and more permanent too. I love the fact, I love the fact that you can't burn this shit off. And the first time, if my players have never seen this before, you know that I'm going to flay their asses just to have it manifest somewhere else. And they're going to be like, whoa, what's this about? Whoa. And like, it's going to be a really cool moment for them to know that they've got this magic now like imbued upon their essence or soul or being or however you want to. Yep. You want to flavor that. So that's a lot of fun. I really like that. Yeah, me too. It's great. So what I wanted to do, um, are, are you doing anything else or nope, can I move on I'm to the good. monsters? Monster. Right. Monster. Um, what I wanted to do originally was talk about the Eberron dragons, but there's not a single dragon listed in the back of the Eberron book. Nothing from Argonison, nothing on progenitor dragons, which I assume would be a CR 50, right? They're the freaking, they literally are the world. So... I know that I talked about Inspired last week. What I'd like to talk about now are the quarry, but I'm going to give you an option here, Dave. Sure. So just as a quick recap, um, the quarry are from Dalcor, and that is the Plane of Dreams. And it's currently dominated by a dark power known as Il Lashtavar, or the Dreaming Dark. Sure. Not to be confused with the organization, the Dreaming Dark, that has infiltrated Eberron. Yeah, that we talked about in the last yeah, episode. Yeah, but but they all serve the the this El, uh, Il Lashtavar, right? Sure. So Il Lashtavar is served by a host of aberrations that are the embodiments of dreams and nightmares, and they are called the Quarry, because it's difficult for anything to physically travel to or from Delcor. Quarry are uh, in Eberron, and they're typically encountered while possessing a host body. So you don't really get to see their true final form. You run into them as people are possessed. The inspired are the most common ways of, of seeing this because they're typically some sort of willing host for the quarry. And we talked about that last episode. Yep. So there are three kinds of quarry. There's the Hashalak quarry. This one is all about lore masters and judges. And they're commonly known as dream stealers. They can compress and configure their hundreds of translucent tendrils to form a wide range of simple shapes. And a point of blue light suspended within its tendril uh, serves as the Hashalak's sensory organ, which can be moved around to suit the creature's current shape, which is super creepy. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So, so that's them. They are CR9. That's, that's okay. the first option. The next one is the Calorak Quarry, which is the most powerful one. Um, they're also known as eye benders. These are entities that are formed of pure shadow that is outlined by like a little nimbus of energy. And a host of disembodied eyes whirl around a Calorak, each reflecting a consciousness the creature has consumed. Interesting. Yeah. They uh, guide the quarry race and the devourer of dreams, who is a personal emissary of the dreaming dark, is a Calorak. So... Although other Caloracs never fight one another overtly, each has its own agenda, and each hopes to someday seize the throne of the Devourer of Dreams. 
because of this internal conflict, you don't usually run into these guys because they don't leave uh, Dalcor. Sure. Um, but it is known to happen very infrequently. These guys are CR 19. Oof. Okay. And the last one is the Sakura quarry. These guys are nightmare creatures. Their headless torsos are covered with eyes and twitching limbs, including two massive arms that end in powerful pinchers. They also have a serpentine tail tipped with a vicious stinger. They're cruel. They're calculating. They enjoy the power that they wield over others as they concoct elaborate uh, schemes to advance their own positions and discredit their rivals. They are consistently, relentlessly scheming about everything, and they always hope to be reincarnated as a more powerful servant of the Dreaming Dark. They want to become the Calorak. Uh, as such, their plans are often focused on the ruination of competitors as they're furthering Il Lashtavar's plans uh, in any way that they can. When they aren't serving in the cities of their nightmare realm, they hunt the dreaming spirits of mortals. Cool. They're also fear mongers. Yeah, I think I know a few of those. Uh, their ability to manipulate the fears of mortals uh, sees Sakura's often sent to Eberron as inspired. Nothing keeps humanoid chattel in line like fear, and Sakura's are the masters of manipulating the uncertainty of mobs and high-ranking officials alike. So just having these guys around brings paranoia. These guys are a challenge rating 7. Okay. Which stat block do you want me to get into? The Kala... The, Kala. the, the CR-19, the yeah, big yeah. guys? So these guys are lawful evil, um, which is pretty straightforward and on the nose because they're all about the dreaming dark and supporting him as much as they can. They've got an AC of 18 uh, because of natural armor. They've got uh, 161, so 19d8 plus 76 hit points. I mean, your CR 19 is what you're going to get. Their speed is 30 feet. Their fly speed, however, and they can hover, is 60 feet. They uh, have a normal strength, but everything else is through the roof. The next lowest is Khan with an 18. Dex is 21, and then Intelligence 23, Wisdom 24, Charisma 25. These guys are nuts. They have huge saving throws. Their skills are Deception, Perception, and Persuasion. Their damage resistances are, get a pen, Cold, Necrotic, Poison, Psychic, and the standard non-magical attacks. Their condition immunities are blinded, charmed, exhausted, frightened, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, and restrained. Because these things are incorporeal creatures, you are going to fight uh, uh, and inspired and then have one of these guys pop out as the final form, right? So you're not going to, even if you were to like petrify uh, and inspired and hold them down and then you, you turn them to stone and they technically die, the quarry will then float out and Fuck your day up. They have true sight of 120 feet and a passive perception of 23. They speak every language ever and have 120 foot telepathy. They can't be surprised as long as it's not incapacitated because they can see everything. They're also incorporeal, which I mentioned, which means that they can move through other creatures and objects as if they're difficult terrain. But of course, you take 1d10 force damage if it ends its turn inside an object. You do have the ability to cast Arcane Eye at will. And you have Clairvoyance, Confusion, Dream, and Eye Bite. Your spell save DC is 21, and you got a plus 13 to hit with spell attacks. So this thing packs a fucking punch. Magic resistance, because of course it does. It has two main attacks, but it has other actions that it can do as well. There's the Arcane Blast, which is a ranged spell attack, plus 13 to hit, 120 feet. Uh, and it does 1d10 plus 7 force damage. Or there's Soul Binding, which does, again, plus 13 to hit, but this one's a melee spell attack. Uh, you can hit one target, and you do 4d10 plus 7 necrotic damage, so it's not force anymore. If a creature is reduced to zero hit points from this attack, and they die, then it has its soul imprisoned in one of the quarry's eyes. The target cannot be revived by any means short of a wish spell until the quarry is destroyed. So, if I kill a player with this, I'm going to steal their soul and fuck off, go, go make a new character sheet. They will escape with this. So um, that's kind of brutal. Now they have multi attack, so they can either do that soul binding attack twice, or they can do four of the arcane blasts, which was the one d ten force damage. That's crazy. So you mean to tell me that they can hit someone with the arcane blast four times? Yeah, and then take the guy who's low on hit points over here, and the guy they just hit on the last turn, hit them with soul binding on the next turn. Yeah, kill them both. 
and all of a sudden half your party is now well they have to die they have to go below like not only reduced to zero oh, they have to fail but their then, saves okay, yeah, yeah they have yeah, to yeah. fail their saves so. okay that makes sense yeah that's crazy but if you kill the quarry if you kill the the Calorac, then you can recover them through the eyes without a wish spell right but remember for things like uh, revivify you have a minute to kill them and then cast the spell sure but a minute can take a long time in D&D oh it can but that's why I say that quarry is going to run yeah 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 fair enough um, so it also has a couple of other crazy things it can do. One of them is called Mind Seed, which is just kind of gross. The quarry touches one humanoid, which must succeed on a DC 21 intelligence save. or what? be Sorry, what, what else has a DC 21 intelligence save? That's huge. Uh, a lot of the gods, uh, like there are stat blocks for um, demon lords. That's what I'm saying. Like this yeah. is, holy shit. Some of the uh, high-powered Celestials do. Like, I think a soul, the Solar's got some really high DCs that you got to make. But that's crazy, isn't it? Especially an intelligence save. Nobody has that. Wizards, Inquisitives, and Artificers are going to be able to resist that. Yeah, you need to be rolling 19 plus. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, you have to make an intelligence saving throw or be cursed. The curse lasts until it's removed by remove curse, which is only a third level spell. Okay. Or Greater Restoration, which is, I believe, a 5th level spell. So they're still Tier 2 or Tier 3. A Cursed Target suffers 1 level of exhaustion every 24 hours, and finishing a long rest does not reduce this exhaustion. If it reaches exhaustion level 6, it doesn't die. It instead becomes a thrall under the quarry's control, and all its exhaustion is removed. Only the Wish spell can free the thrall from this control. So if you don't have access... To remove curse or greater restoration, you've got five days to do it. Because on day six, you just become a, became an agent of the bad guy. And you can only get rid of it with a wish. Yep. It also... And it can only do that once a day. All right. So, oh, gee. Only once a day? <laughs> I would have I would have a Calorac Quarry honestly be the big bad guy for tier three. Yeah, I could see that. It also has the ability to do... Uh, an action called Swarm of Eyes, which just sounds delicious, doesn't it? This recharges on a six. The quarry creates a swarm of spectral eyes that fills a 30-foot radius sphere centered on a point it can see within 60 feet of it. Each creature in that area must make a DC 21 wisdom save. Again, that's going to be way more common. Clerics, druids, rangers, sure. they're all going to be up there with that, right? On a failure, a creature takes 10d8 psychic damage and is blinded for a minute. On a success, it takes half as much damage and isn't blinded. A blinded creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns because this is 5th edition and nothing is permanent. But that is a ton of damage and you're blinded. So that's that's a lot of fun. So one of the ways that I deal with uh, with recharging powers is I often like to, to come out of nowhere. Like I would have an Inspired there. The quarry lives in the Inspired. The quarry jumps out of the Inspired, blasts someone with this, jumps back into the Inspired, and the Inspired runs. When a full minute in-game happens, I will just assume that it this has recharged. I will continue to roll a D6 for 10 rounds, and if I don't hit a 6, I will assume it has recharged. Sure. Right, so that's roughly... Um, that's pretty safe. I like the picture of this creature. It looks like some sort of crazy praying mantis snake that's entirely black and wreathed in glowing flaming red energy and eyeballs and it's just it's this is the thing of nightmares i love it i think it is absolutely amazing yeah it's it's well done i don't know i love this monster the quarry are really cool i like anything that possesses the um the dibic demon is another one that really sticks out to me so i really 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 like this and if you can establish the CR7 and CR9 quarry a little bit earlier in the campaign, I would just steal these for any homebrew and say, good luck, guys, you're dealing with possession. That brings a whole new aspect to D&D. It does. I mean, the one thing I, I think I mentioned in the past is that I tend to shy away from the psionics and the psychic and that kind of thing. But this would be a good way to get a little bit of that flavor mm -hmm. as, your, as your tier three big bad evil guy. Yeah. Right? You can just, you can attack one of these guys, you can screw around with it a little bit, and then move on past it again. It allows you to dabble with it without committing to it fully. 
Also, when it pops out and it looks like this big, scary, wreathed, praying mantis with these floating eyeballs, you know, surrounded by flames, and it comes out and starts doing all these crazy mind things and hitting you with necrotic damage, goes back into the host who screams and says, I don't want it. They're all thinking demon. They're sprinkling holy water on you, but you're an aberration and it has no effect. They're all going to piss themselves. Yeah. Wait a minute. This isn't a lower planes thing. This is a far realms thing. Cool. This is a great way to take your experienced players and knock them on their asses. Yeah, and Eberron, this is not a Kyber thing. This is an extra planar thing. Absolutely. The, yeah. These guys are, are yeah, they're not even Delkir aberrations. They are the plane of dreams. Yeah. And they're, and they're nightmare creatures. What's interesting is none of them are dream creatures. They're all nightmare creatures. That's what all the stat blocks are because, I mean... That's what you would fight. In theory, there are good quarry as well, but we don't really get to see them. All right, was there anything else with them? Um, well, I could talk about these guys all day. Well, sure, I, but let's... But, yeah, let, let's let's move on. I'm sure that Jed is is hawking some wares for us to go check out. Probably. So. Anyway, for those of you listening at home, this series, as well as other role-playing series, um, are available on the It's a Mimic feed on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, and lots of other podcast apps, so don't forget to follow or subscribe on whatever app you're listening to. Also, tell your friends, and check out uh, the most recent entries uh, that we've released here on this and the other regular series on www.itsamimic.com. And feel free to support us by hitting that donate button. Thanks for listening to this episode of It's a Mimic, Touring the Multiverse. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook, or you can find me at the subreddit r slash it's a mimic. Until next time, I'm Dave. And I am a quarry inside Adam's body. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. Just do it. And we'll be back with more Eberron information and crazy adventure inspiration next week. But first, let's go see Jed. Okay! Hey, come on down today and get yourself a bottle of Jed's Secret Serum. We're talking curing conditions. We're talking about curing poisons. We're talking about people who just can't goddamn move. Hey, Adam and Dave, I see you over there. You better not be hiding from me, your old pal Jed. Oh, oh I wouldn't hide from you, Jed. God damn it. Okay. Hi, Jed. Hey, how are my two favorite pricks? How are you guys doing? Oh, well, actually, no, we're doing great, Jed. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right, but that's uh, that's pretty run of the mill for this guy. Always on top, you know what I mean? On top of what? Or who? Fucking anything and anybody. I believe that. All right, let me ask you two a question. All right, Are you guys tired of dealing the same old damage? I mean, sometimes. Yeah, maybe you're looking to add a little flair to the fight. Yeah, what do you got, fellas? Have I got a wooden rod that will fit right up your alley? Tell me more. My interest is peaked. My interest is peaking. All right, cut from a tree infused with extra planar energy. This imbued wood focus will add a little oomph to your spellcaster's delivery. Using this item as your spellcasting focus deals extra damage of many different varieties, from fire to necrotic to lightning and thunder. Depending on what species of wood, we can bring a whole bunch of shit to the table. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's not so bad, hey? To me, it just looks like a fucking piece of wood, but uh, it's not bad. Yeah, I would be interested in that. Got anything else? Yeah, I mean, uh, from the looks of it, you guys are kind of seeming more of uh, the the defensive uh, type here. Would I be right in saying that? I uh, yeah, sure. I think we're tired of being offensive. Oh, I never get tired of that, fucker. All right, whatever you tell yourself, David. Nevertheless, behold the orb of shielding. Shielding, yes, shielding. If any spellcaster is tuned to and holding the orb when taking damage, the orb will reduce the blow if it's made of the corresponding planar material. Interesting. What do you mean by that? Well, this thing here, it's made from uh, many different types of planar materials that are out of this fucking world, believe me. What's this one that you've got right here? This one here is my barn obsidian. It's going to protect you from all necrotic damage. But say you get attacked with force damage, this shit's not going to do a damn thing forward, you know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's cool. So this obsidian only comes from Mabar? 
Yeah, this obsidian is very exclusive to Mabar. Oh, oh that's, cool. pre that's pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is fucking cool. And if you're constantly finding yourself in dangerous situations, either of these wondrous items will aid the bravest or not so brave adventures. This isn't that uh, this isn't that big either. I could just hold this in one hand. Sure, yeah, I'll take one of these. How much? Um, I think uh, I think I'd probably let this go for about ten gold piece today, Dave. Adam. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Do you have one that protects from radiant damage? Maybe from Irian? Um, let me take a quick look here. All right, is that okay? Yeah, it doesn't look like I got one on me today, Dave, but uh, you come back, I'll get you one, all right? Pre-order, if you all will. All right, all right. Sure, that sounds good to me. Yeah, okay, all right. So just to make sure you want an eerie in quartz. Yes. All right, sounds good. It's going to be ready for you next week, David. Do you need it uh, packaged as a gift? Uh, yeah, a gift receipt, please. All right, that's uh, 20 extra gold pieces. I don't mind paying for quality. All right, Dave, so your total for today is going to be 25 gold pieces. All right, all right, here you go. Oh, thank you very much, my good sir. All right, well, if there's anything else I can do for you, boys. I want the necrotic one. You want the necrotic one. Do you want the the gift wrap and uh, receipt, all that fun stuff? No. No, you're... What, you say like it's Jay. a bad fucking deal. You're saying, like, what are you calling Jay, me here? Stop, stop trying to rip me off. You I'm know not what? trying to rip Good you off. Jay. You guys come here all the time. You barely spend any money. I'm just trying to fucking make some, okay? Yeah, all right. All right, ten gold pieces for the, for the necrotic. We're good to go. There. Good. Here you go. Alright, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it was great seeing you again, boys. And if uh, you come back next week, we're going to have a little bit more of the rarer items on for sale. Alright, sounds good. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, me too. Hey, it's going to be a good one. Up the alley of all adventurers, not just Dave. Alright, bye, Jed. Hey, see you later, Adam. You have a great evening. Hey, you know we take gold, we take copper, we take silver, we take IOUs, we take your mother, we take your children, whatever fucking works. We just gotta make a deal, huh? Come on down to Jed's today, we'll take care of you. <laughs>